from a man and his word, a man and his relationship with God, to a man and his relationship with his family, a man and his marriage. We looked at the idea of a man's work and why a man works and how a man works, that God is the first worker, that in our work we are not only able to provide for ourselves and for our families, but also we are able to see and pursue truth, beauty, and goodness. We also saw that that sort of connected to the idea of a man as God because we have God's command to the man which ultimately was violated and the violation of that brought upon the penalty that was passed um, from Adam to all of those who proceeded from him. And this is why the work of redemption is necessary. Man has to be redeemed. That there is a debt that we owe. There is a death that we owe to God that we cannot pay apart from an eternity in hell where God's wrath is poured out without end. And so, somehow, there has to be this satisfaction of God's wrath, this expression of God's justice, and this forgiveness from God. And this is what the last Adam is all about. But before we get to that place, we look at another relationship that is often seen only in the context of after the fall, and we view it as another creation ordinance. We look at marriage from the standpoint of why and how God created it in Genesis. And I believe that we are living in times where it is more important than ever before to understand this and to communicate this. Here's what I also want to say. Christians, many Christians, live under the assumption that the creation ordinances as they relate to marriage really belong only to the church. And that other people, um, the secular state for example, are, are not responsible to uphold this. Uh, many in, in my country are, are arguing that what we really need to do now is we just need to get the state out of the marriage business, let the state go on and do whatever it's going to do, and, and we need to just go over here and, and, and do our own thing um, where, where we see marriage as what it's really supposed to be. Um, there are several problems with that, not the least of which is this. God judges secular nations for violating his law. He makes it clear in Leviticus, <laughs> these nations are being driven out because of these sins and abominations. Don't do these things because it's because of these things that these nations have been driven out. Isn't that interesting? We sit here and say, well, no, for us as Christians, we're obligated to that. But these other individuals, they're not. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They will be judged by God. We are being judged by God according to Romans chapter 1. We are right now walking in and experiencing Romans 1 judgment. Today. Today. And so, one of the things we need to be aware of is this. There are consequences that follow inevitably when you redefine marriage. There are ways that this judgment sort of manifests itself. A couple of things that happen this. Number one, marriage falls out of favor. We, we've seen this in continental Europe. Marriage falls out of favor. When, when you open up the doors for same-sex marriages and other sorts of marriages, marriage falls out of favor. Um, the second thing that happens as marriages fall out of favor is single parenthood grows exponentially and men become absent. But once, you, once you've taken this away, he, he, let me see how I can put it this way. Just in the natural order of things, the way things happen, 
it's much easier to get women to understand and own up to their responsibility to their children. 40 weeks, 40 weeks to carry a child. And then after the 40 weeks of carrying the child, there is a birth that occurs and the child is nourished from their bodies. And even if they want to get up and leave the child, they can't. Physically, they're not able to. God in his providence has created a situation where the woman is linked to this child for 40 weeks. The child feeds at the woman's breast thereafter. The woman can't get up and go anywhere because of the trauma of the situation. And there, there are things that God does naturally that just force mother and child together. And it doesn't, take, it doesn't take a lot of pressure, a lot of cultural pressure, to convince women of their duty and responsibility toward their children. It's unnatural for women to leave their children. It happens more and more today because of some things that are going on in our culture. But it's, it's virtually unheard. It just didn't happen. Men, on the other hand, have actually historically required external pressure and accountability in order to own their responsibility for their children. What happens when you redefine marriage, when you undermine marriage, you're actually undermining that institution that has been the glue that held men to their children for thousands of years. And what happens inevitably is you have human elephants. Learned this one of my many trips over to South Central Africa. You go out on a safari and see the elephants. And elephants live in two herds. There's a breeder herd. The breeder herd is the female elephants and the young elephants who are dependent upon them. Then there's a bachelor herd. And when the males come of a certain age, they leave the breeder herd and they go to the bachelor herd. And when you undermine marriage, humans start to act almost exactly like elephants in that regard. Men are no longer tethered to their children. And children grow up without their fathers, which is always detrimental to children. Always. This is why the Bible has so much to say about our care for widows and orphans. They're in a unique position, in a vulnerable position, and have unique needs. And what we're doing as a culture is creating an environment, not only where we are openly defiling marriage, and openly rebelling against God, but in a very natural sense, we're creating an environment where children will be harmed. Another thing that happens when you begin to undermine marriage, is that children are not only harmed, but children begin to be hypersexualized. Mm -hmm. and, and we haven't even begun to talk about this, this, this 900 pound gorilla that is about to come after the church. Again, it's already happening in continental Europe. It's going to happen here, it's going to happen in the United States. And we're seeing a picture of it now. Again, I've had conversations with pastors, and they think that all we need to do, all we need to do is just, you know, go over here and do our own thing and just say, hey, y'all go ahead and have it. You have your marriage stuff over there, we'll do our marriage stuff over here. Others are arguing, no, 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 what we need to do is say, you know, we get this tax-exempt status. If we just give up our tax-exempt status, then they can't come after us. Mm, have you heard about the lady who owned the bakery? She wasn't tax-exempt. And they came after her. Not only did they sue her and win, ironically, in her state, same-sex marriage was not legal. So she was being asked to provide a service for a ceremony that in her state was against the law. <clears throat> she gets sued, she loses, and she's fined so heavily that her business, her pension, all of her belongings are gone. That's the 900 pound gorilla that is about to beat down the door of the church and say, you will 
comply or we will destroy you. That's what's coming, folks. And it has to. Why does it have to? Here's why. Because we didn't see the argument that was being made. There was a book. It was written in 1989. The title of it is After the Ball. Um, the subtitle is How America Will Overcome Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the Decade of the 90s. Uh, two authors, Kirk and Matson, Russell Kirk and Hunter Matson, they were both professors at, at Harvard University, one in psychology and the other in marketing. The book was published in 1989. There was a meeting that happened in 1988, um, a number of leading homosexual activists. Kirk and Matson had written an article in 1987 where they outlined a propaganda strategy um, to use AIDS uh, as a lever to sort of turn homosexuals um, from a vilified group to uh, a, 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 a minority group deserving of sympathy. So in 1988, this meeting happens. Um, a number, 100 and something, you know, leading uh, activists. They get together to sort of work through how they can um, sort of initiate this Kirk and Matson strategy. The book After the Ball, and it's not easy to get today, if you get it, if, if you got the book today and you didn't look at the publication date, you would assume that you were reading history of what's happened since 1989 until today to change the way we think about homosexuality. It would be hard to believe if nobody showed you the date and then you come to the end of the book, you know, you could, man, that's, a, that's an amazing historical account of what happened. And then they say, no, actually that was written in 1989. You say, no. Mm -mm. Not possible. Not possible. Who could have known that? Who could have done that in 1989? Well, here's the strategy that they used. The strategy that they used is now often referred to as the gay is the new black strategy. Okay? Sexual orientation is the same as ethnicity. It is as immutable as ethnicity. Okay? This is the idea. So the argument is to discriminate against a person because of their sexual orientation. And now there's dozens of different sexual orientations that are being acknowledged. To discriminate against a person because of their sexual orientation is the exact same thing that's discriminating against somebody because of their ethnicity. It's the exact same thing. Well, if that's the case, and this was the argument, and this is what governments hear, Continental Europe and the United States are acting upon. This is the premise that they're acting upon. If that's the case, then ultimately, you have to treat even a church that says, we're not going to embrace this, the same way you would treat a church that put a sign outside the door and say, black people need not come in. You're going to have to treat this the exact same way. And they've known it since the beginning. Beginning. This was the end game. They make a mockery of the whole, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin mentality in the book. And ultimately the response is, that's not enough. You must embrace this. You must denounce those things in your own scriptures that do not embrace this. You must raise up theologians who give you alternative readings on those texts so that you can revamp and remake your religion in order to embrace this. And if you do not, you must go away. Church's response has been, well, if we just love them enough, So the 900-pound gorilla is coming to kick down the door. And we're standing there with flowers. Because <laughs> if they just see the flowers in our smiles, they won't rip our arms off and beat us to death with them. <coughs> Do you know what you call a person who's in a fight and doesn't know it? The loser. <laughs> <laughs> And up to 
this point, that's where we are, folks. That's where we are. And so, again, there's that. What I want to deal with here in, in, the, in the moments that we have left is what do we do in the vacuum that's created? Because we know that sodomy is not a lifestyle, it's a death style. The highest rates of alcoholism, the highest rates of suicide. Here's what's interesting. They blame us for that. These people are killing themselves because you won't embrace them. Well, then it ought to follow that in continental Europe where it's being embraced and churches are being forced to embrace it and where it's just the norm for folks to just act like, hey, it's great. It, it would follow then that the rates of suicide and drug addiction and alcoholism and all these other things, it, it would follow that they go down, right? <laughs> no. No, actually, they don't. They go up. Because it's the vileness of the sin that is causing this. It's not a lifestyle. It's a death style. And so as people get what they're asking for here, what's going to happen is they're not going to be satisfied. They're not going to be happy. Isn't it ironic that they call this gay? They're not going to be happy. The truth is going to be exposed. This lifestyle is going to be exposed for what it is. I'll give you another example. Right now in the United States, I'm not even meaning to go to, I'm still going to, we're going to get here in a minute, all right? But right now in the United States, um, you know, there's a big campaign, and it was a big campaign in the NFL. Um, you know, in, in, in the NFL, there are a couple of embarrassing cases, you know, domestic violence type stuff. And, Ray Rice, you know, knocking out his girlfriend in the elevator. I know y'all saw that over here, right? Um, and so the NFL is cracking down on domestic violence, and Ray Rice is out of the league. Um, there's another individual, there's several other individuals who had, you know, domestic violence cases, and they're being suspended for this, for that, for the other. But here's a, a deep, dark little secret that no one wants to talk about. Um, Lesbian relationships have far higher rates of domestic abuse than do male-female relationships. A woman in a relationship with another woman is far more likely to be abused and far more brutally than a woman who's in a relationship with a man. But we don't talk about that. Ray Rice out of the league. Other players suspended for multiple games. Hope Solo, the goalie for our women's soccer team. A number of domestic violence cases. She's missed nothing. Why? Folks, it's not about loving and protecting women. It's about promoting a narrative that undermines marriage. The narrative is women are un, uh, unsafe in relationships with men. That's the narrative. And that narrative has to be pounded and pounded and pounded regardless of the facts. Men are unsafe. Men are unsafe and men are unnecessary. You just go get your gay friend to be a donor for you and y'all go, you know, get inseminated and have your, but you don't need a man. You don't need a man. Well, what if I need, if you need anything else, then the, the government will be there. The government will be your man. But you don't need a man. This is the picture that's being painted. This is the narrative. And here's the thing. We know that that's not true. So what's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. It's already happened. A generation of women who are isolated, alone, and unprotected, completely dissatisfied, and a generation of children who do not know what a father looks like. Who do not know what a marriage looks like. Enter God's people with a word from the Lord. And with marriages that 
function as a living, breathing portrait of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. I believe that we are entering into days that will allow us to shine more brightly than we ever have before in this particular area. And I think this is going to be our gospel springboard. There are people who, if you walk in and open a Bible, they're not gonna, they don't want to hear it, especially in these days. The church is the enemy. The church is the narrow-minded, bigoted, backwards, you know, you know women preaching. Y'all are crazy, right? Th that's us. But when the pain, when the pain kicks in, and when you realize that there's something that's wrong, people who wouldn't necessarily listen to us talk about ABC 1, 2, 3 will be glad to hear from someone who says, you know, there is a better way on this marriage and family thing. There is something that has actually worked extremely well for thousands of years. And this, because of the way it's connected to the gospel that we proclaim, is a natural entree into gospel conversations. All right, that was extra. Let's look at this text. And I just want to just show you what I want to do here. Because, again, we don't, we, we don't have time to deal with this the way that we did with the others. But I just want to show you a few things here. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Um, pause. It's not good for the man to be alone. You know, I, I, whenever I talk about, about this, I always point out the fact that this is the first time that God says something is not good. Right? First, the, in the first chapter, we got a pattern. You know, let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was very good. Right? We got that in the first chapter. Now in the second chapter, something's not good. If this is an email, this is bold, italicized, underlined, and then another color. Okay? It's not good. But sin hasn't entered into the world yet, so we're not talking about moral good here. I'm not saying that it's sinful for people to not be married. We know also from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and Matthew 19 that there are people who have a supernatural gift of singleness. God bless them. I met Bridget January 21st, 1989. My sophomore year in college. We got married June 30th, 1989. Because we had to wait till summertime. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have wasted so much time. But <laughs> so I, I don't. But what I can tell you is, there's a group of men. You know how you try to wax, you try to wax romantic sometimes. And I'll never forget. You know, usually that's yeah, wonderful. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm pretty good at that. And so I was trying to wax romantic with my wife, and I don't know how we got onto this, but I, I just I said something about how much she means to me. I just don't know what happened if something you know happened to her. And I don't know how we even got on that subject. And I was like, I. I I don't know if I could just ever get married to another person again. And she goes, I'll give you six months. <laughs> what, is that? What, what are you, how could you question my you know, how, what, what? And she's like, babe, I know you. <laughs> You're not going to be okay. <laughs> I was like, well, well, you could be wrong. <laughs> Some people have that gift. Other people don't. Some people have a supernatural gift from God to live a life serving the Lord as single people. And we know that there are advantages that come from that for these individuals and for the church. And we praise God for people who leverage that for God's service and for God's kingdom. So we know, therefore, that when he says it's not good here, what he's not talking about is everybody has to be married. So what is he talking about? Let me give you this briefly. A, a number of things. First of all, God makes man in his own image. Male and female 
he created it there. If you want to see the image of God, you cannot look at maleness and see the image of God in its fullness. And you cannot look at femaleness and see the image of God in its fullness. You need the two corresponding halves, the two complementary halves of humanity together in order to see an accurate picture of the image of God. By the way, this is why Heather shouldn't have two mamas or two daddies. Because it is, it is breaking the very picture of the image of God. It is actually a blasphemy against God himself. It is as though you take the Mona Lisa and you take you know, a marker to it and just mar this picture. You can't do that. God has said, here is a picture of my image. And so we need those two halves. We need those two complementary halves in order to see a picture of the image of God. But I believe that there's another picture here. You know, the triune God makes man in his image. God who has existed eternally in one God and three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Son is not the Father of the Spirit. And, you know, the Father is not the Son of the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. And yet, it's one God. This one God makes man in his image. This God with the Son who is eternally begotten of the Father. And the Spirit, who eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, makes man in his image. That's not good. But then, from the side of the man proceeds the woman. And from the union of the man and the woman proceeds children. And you have, as it were, a triune representation of the triune God. This beautiful picture. And you can't get it person without this union between male and female. You also can't have marriage without male and female. Here's the news flash for the people in Westminster, for the people in Washington, for the people everywhere else. You can no more call a man with another man or a woman with another woman marriage than you can call dry land, the ocean. You don't get to do that. It's another thing. It is not marriage. It will never be marriage. It can never be marriage. Marriage is the bringing together of these two complementary halves of humanity <coughs> with a view toward that which only these complementary halves can do in reproducing. There are three main purposes for marriage. <laughs> we just talked about one, illustration. Illustration. It, 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 it's an earthly picture of a, a heavenly relationship. The second one is procreation. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. You can't do that without the two corresponding halves. This is a purpose of marriage. Okay? This is the purpose of, of marriage. Now, does that mean that every marriage is going to have children? No, not every marriage has children. But children can only be produced from the complementary bringing together of the male and the female. Which means that because of that, marriage must categorically be male, female. You see, the other side says, well, world, if you believe that, then you believe that people who are beyond childbearing years shouldn't be able to marry. Why? We're talking about categories here. Talk about the categories of maleness and femaleness. And that the categories work together because it's the only way you get reproduction. So categorical is the second one. Procreation. Procreation is not just about having children either. Procreation is about the cultural mandate. Procreation is about subduing the earth. We already looked at the fact that subduing the earth is done under God's leadership. We subdue the earth the way God says the earth is to be subdued, which means that as we bear children, we must disciple our children so that they understand truth, beauty, and goodness, and the law of God as well. So procreation is not just about having children. It's about raising them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord for the glory of God. Okay? And then thirdly, it's about sanctification. It's about sanctification. I love how the Puritans 
this road about, we don't, we don't write about this anymore. You, it, it was hard, it's hard to read the old Puritans on marriage without having a discussion of the fact that God gave us marriage so that we'd have a natural outlet for our sexual desires. We don't talk about that anymore because we have been so, I don't even know what the word is, this whole, the, the idea of romanticism has just killed us. And, and so we don't, we, we don't get it, but you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it doesn't get clearer. That's, that's good for a man not to touch a woman. But you know what? If you're not able, better to marry than to burn with passion. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I remember that. You know, we, it's interesting. You know, I, I, was, I was playing football. I know you probably find it hard to believe, but I playing football in the U.S. Um, in college. And here we were getting ready to get married. And the non-Christians on my campus were absolutely for us. They were like, yeah, this sounds crazy, but, you know, y'all supposed to be Christians. Seem like you ought to do crazy stuff, right? They were like, yeah, that, that's awesome. The Christians on our campus, they, they weren't ready for us. Well, you know, what, what, what are you doing? What are you, why would you do this? What are you, why, why, don't, why don't you, why don't you wait? Why don't you, you know, because it says over there in the second hesitation, thou shalt not marry until after graduation, right? <laughs> uh, so what? And I, I just, I remember distinctly, I mean, having conversations with people saying, listen, the wisest man in the Bible, the most godly man in the Bible, the strongest man in the Bible, all fell to sexual sin. I'm not wiser than Solomon. I'm not more godly than David. I'm not stronger than Samson. I'm getting married. <laughs> so sanctification. Sanctification. So what's wrong with uh, these same-sex unions or, or what will follow from these same-sex unions? What, what's, what's wrong is... Number one, it blasphemes the image, right? So there's purpose number one. Purpose number two, procreation. It, it, it cannot procreate categorically. Number three, sanctification. Well, it is taking what God clearly calls evil and sinful and saying that it is acceptable. So all three of the main purposes for which God gave marriage are violated in these unions. All right. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, the birds of the heavens, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. A couple of things here. Seems out of place, right? Not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper suitable for him. Seems like the next verse ought to say, so he made Eve. No. We'll make a help or suitable for him. Name the animals. That just doesn't even work. What, what are you doing? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, this demonstrates, as Calvin argues, that marriage is God's idea, not man's. Adam didn't know he had a need, let alone how to meet the need. Nor did he have the means to meet the need. This need was going to have to be met supernaturally. So we see here that marriage is God's idea, which again means Westminster, Washington, D.C., I don't care. You do not get to determine what this thing is. God did this. It was his idea, and we must submit to it. We don't get to mess around with it. Second thing here is bestiality and zoorasty are hereby eliminated. Wow. He needs somebody. He names the whole animal kingdom, and none of those are fit for him. Bestiality, zoorasty, wrong. Wrong. Already in Genesis. It gets spelled out later, but already in Genesis, it's wrong. It's wrong. Look at the next part of this. There's another reason that this happens. Um, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man 
he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman or Isha because she's taken out of each, Ish or man. This is at last. What does that mean? After all the other things that I've named, this is the corresponding part. None of those other things were the corresponding part, okay? Here's the other thing. Male headship in marriage is established here. How? The woman was made after the man. We already heard about that earlier, male headship. The woman was made for the man, male headship. The woman was made from the man, male headship. The woman was brought to the man, male headship. And the woman was named by the man, like everything else, male headship. Male headship is not a product of the fall. It's a creation ordinance. We see this in the text we saw earlier. We also see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Male headship. Even the fall itself in Romans chapter 5, when Paul talks about the fall, he doesn't say even, you know, because Adam and Eve sinned, that, you know, that death entered the world by saying, you know, that's not what he says. He says, because Adam sinned. The New Testament views the fall of man through the federal headship of Adam. Of Adam. So we see male headship here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's a couple of things here. Number one.